right, ecological design is the art and science by which we would remake the human presence on Earth. And it applies to how we provision ourselves with food, energy, shelter, clean water, materials, waste cycling, entertainment, health care, virtually everything. Design is not a typical discipline. The discipline, say, of architecture is a subfield of a larger subject called ecological design. Design typically has been how we make things, but ecological design is how we make things that fit. And that means the fittedness between an artifact, a technology, or a house, or a community, and the larger system is the key question. And when you say that, you, you can't, there's a caveat here, because about that larger context as it, as it plays out over time, we're mostly ignorant about how those bigger systems over long periods of time work. As a design is always about margins of error, resilience, not betting at all on a single throw of the dice, and not assuming that, uh, as Robert Sincharmer once put it, that nature uh, does not play uh, or set traps for unwary species. Uh, design is about caution. It's about precaution. It's about harmony. It's about patterns. It's about weaving systems and strands together in a way that's durable for long periods of time, but changeable and resilient. You mentioned um, in your latest book that um, design could be conceived as a healing profession. Could you say a couple of things about that? Well, the humans on the face of the earth uh, have been something of a oftentimes a disaster and it would be difficult to identify any technology or any human advancement that didn't move carbon skyward or seaward. Uh, the hoe, primitive uh, tools way back when, started the process by which we began to tinker with climate. We've accelerated that and that's now an exponential process. So the problem that we the problem that we have is that we've been digging a hole for ourselves as a species on this planet for a long time and in the last 50 or 70 years the damage has become uh, what appears to be catastrophic if allowed to go much further. Ecological design in that sense is a healing process. It's how we understand patient earth, as Robert Sokolow once put it in a wonderful book 30 years ago, and how we understand ourselves and our own health to be dependent on the health of the larger body of earth, Gaia. And the idea that the species can be healthy and prosperous on a planet run to rack and ruin uh, isn't just wrong, it's a form of mental derangement that, uh, for which I don't have any words. Um. Do you see the increasing climate chaos and, and the looming scenario of peak oil as um, the end of civilization or an opportunity for a new start? And do you think we will have a powered descent or a crash and then a rebuilding? <laughs> we don't know that yet. That, that's what is at stake. That's the, the fork in the road or whatever. And one of the difficulties, again, with this is this issue of leads and lags. What we have already initiated in terms of climate change, as we were talking coming in the door, that 30 years of difference between the emission of the carbon that amplified the seawater temperature, that amplified the storm that hit Louisiana, we call Katrina. But we don't know where we are, no, nor, neither do we know yet how wise, intelligent, and far-sighted our response can be because we haven't responded yet, which is to say we've, we've been pretty stupid up to this point. So fork in the road, uh, well, absolutely. Even if we decide to take the fork toward opportunity, we do not know for sure whether the opportunity itself has passed. 
it may be that that's the that that's the nightmare scenario but i think we ought to assume that it hasn't passed that we can make something much better of this than otherwise would occur if we simply let nature take its course and run carbon emissions uh, carbon levels in the atmosphere to 550 600 800 1000 parts per million uh, that truly would be the end of civilization by everything that we know now. That would destroy us. So, uh, good question, and that's not an answer. That's simply, you, you've defined, I think, where we are at this moment. And in um, the nature of design, you speak about the need to um, invent or reinvent the idea of a sustainable human civilization and then distribute it as widely as possible and as quickly as possible. Um, this very, very much points towards it's not about nations against nations anymore, it's about the survival of humanity um, on mm -hmm. this planet. Could you say a few more things about that? Well, let, let me just say two things. Uh, the, the issue, sustainability, isn't just about technology and systems and housing and so forth. It will be very much about it. It will be won or lost on, on the battle of equity and fairness. There's no sustainable world that could be made around inequity. And there is no inequitable world that we, we would want to sustain anyway. The, um, the politics of it are going to be particularly troubling. It'll be much easier to see how we make solar collectors than how we make a solar-powered civilization. That's going to be require a level of political inventiveness that we haven't seen on this planet. The corporation, I think, is a peculiarly maladapted institution. It's adapted to extraction of materials and to endless economic growth. Those uh, are assumptions we can no longer safely hold. And so what the politics will be, and a politics that says that our great-great-grandchildren have standing, which is to say a right to stop parts of our behavior that deprive them in terms of our constitution of life liberty and property. So sustainability and ecological design are about seeing the world as, as a system and the interconnections over long periods of time. Those are two fundamental changes and they run against virtually everything that we've done scientifically and technologically in the past uh, uh, 300 years. Our science has proceeded by disaggregation, not by aggregation. It's proceeded in small steps without uh, adequate regard for the most part for the long term. But systems of governance will be the same, face the same challenge. We, we have to understand how to govern in terms of systems and patterns over long periods of time that honor the rights of uh, uh, generations uh, five, six, seven removed from our own. Where do you see the role of um grassroots movements like the permaculture movement and the eco-village movement in the shift towards a sustainable civilization? Well, I think they're, they're the, the groups, I think, in the trenches uh, uh, trying to create patterns of actual living and livelihood that will work in such a world. But in the absence of larger changes and a larger consensus at the very top of society, I think a good bit of that will be wasted. So I see this as not exclusively a top-down movement. That won't work. Uh, neither can it be a, a simply bottom-up movement. There will have to be some coordination between the upper layers and the, uh, the grassroots uh, organization. So I see that as critically important for people to begin to see what life could be like lived beyond consumption and live beyond one way the extractive economy from mine to dump and eco-villages and permaculture and 
uh, community supported agriculture and hundreds of other kinds of related enterprises are the inventive wing or the inventive edge or the cutting edge of this movement and they're important as much as anything else for what they do to spark our ecological and social imagination of possibilities. Uh, they're necessary to help build a consensus that this is not ruin. We, we don't have to uh, go with a whimper or bang, that we, we can in fact live quite well, in fact I think better than we now live. In a world that's more humane, that um, uh, operates at a slower clock speed that uh, conserves nature and people and and so forth that that's a better world but to believe that people will have to see that we're visual creatures and that that's important that people uh, see to be able to understand what is possible to do and um, in your latest book you mentioned that um, Beautiful quote. Where is it? Um, our, our choice is not whether we are spiritual um, or not. It's wh whether um, our spiritual energy is directed towards authentic um, purposes or not. Mm -hmm. um, and you also start the the book with a um, poem that uh, mentions the four elements and spirit. Earth, air, fire, water. That's yeah. my first cut at poetry. Um, where do you see the role of spirit and the sacred, the dimension of the sacred in this? Oh, uh, you know, my, my sense, Daniel, is that, that humans are inevitably spiritual. And the question again is not whether we are, but whether we are authentically spiritual or not. Uh, it bubbles out of us. We're, we're creatures, uh, we're meaning-seeking creatures. And if my highest meaning in my life is soccer, uh, I will make soccer my religion and it will orient my life. It will give my life meaning and gravity and purpose and direction. Uh, it just happens to be a bad religion. Uh, I could make environmentalism a religion. Uh, that happens to be a bad religion. Uh, we, we can't help but make something into a belief system. And you can argue why this is uh, for us, but this, this goes back to cave paintings. This is part of humanity. As soon as we can identify a human species, we see the species trying to grow up. What does this mean? Where are we? How did we get here? Who are we? You see these questions being asked. They pop up in early philosophy, early art. This, this is what it means to be human. Um, what, what the consumer and the economic uh, driven, the, the economy driven world did was to assume away spirituality of any kind of authentic kind. And it said that the world is purely secular uh, and we can satisfy human uh, needs and wants by purely secular means, but we have it on high authority that we don't live by bread alone. And uh, you find this this kind of desperate search for meaning in the modern world. We had to invent words like anomy and meaning rootlessness. For that was Emile Durkheim. And uh, we, we have all kinds of behavior patterns that show uh, the need for authentic belief, the need for authentic work, not just a job, but good work, work that fits a larger scheme of meaning. And the modern world <clears throat> has a surfeit of stuff, but is uh, pauperized at the level of meaning. We're long on means, but short on ends, as somebody once put it, which is a different play on those words. But uh, for this to be authentically religious, we will have to do something that is incredibly difficult to do. We'll have to decide not just how we make ourselves sustainable, but why we should be sustained. That's a much more difficult thing. Uh, there is an old uh, Islamic tale, the tale of the jinn, 
in which the animals uh, have humans on trial. And it was retold by Joanna Macy and uh, Jonathan Seed in a book, the title of which I can't recall, but... Thinking Like a Mountain. So uh, Thinking Like a Mountain. Is that it? I think so. Uh, they, they retell this, and I have my students sometimes do this. And I just wrote a column on this that comes out in Conservation Biology, but it, uh, the column is simply called The Trial. It'll be the open chapter in the new book I'm working on. But imagine being in the dock and having to, and you're the attorney for the human species. What case would you make uh, to all the critters who have been rendered sentient and given voice? How would you defend humankind? And I think there, there can be a, there, there is a defense that can be made, but I think we have to make it. And I think we have to understand not just uh, that we can survive. I mean, all this, if we do all this gadgetry, if we're just smart enough, but that we are good enough to deserve uh, longevity. And I think the, the point of that exercise is, is simply this, that if we knew why we should survive, we would better understand, I think, how we might survive. And so it's not an idle debating question. And it takes you to the core of spirituality. What do we owe? How are we obliged? Uh, what do we owe to the far distant future? What do we owe to the distant past? Uh, what does it mean for us to be stewards or trustees? Uh, and that takes you back, if you push those questions back far enough, who are we? What are we? Was our role here on the planet simply to uh, uh, dig up carbon and release it to the atmosphere and then expire? Was, was that what we were all about? I don't think so. I think there's a higher destiny waiting for us. But that, that means that for us, we will have to find common ground politically, morally, and spiritually. And that doesn't mean all believe the same thing. It means a common ground of tolerance, acceptance, forgiveness, love, compassion before we can find the higher ground by which we might survive. That higher ground, let's call it sustainability or whatever whatever term fits. But the task of finding common ground in the very best that humanity has been and the best that we can be. And that in every way is going to be a spiritual task. It will not be a technological kind of thing. Uh, and it will happen, one final note here, I think that it will happen with a level of spiritual leadership uh, rather like a Gandhi uh, or Desmond Tutu or Martin Luther King who is able to articulate a level of reality that is impossible to articulate if we only focus on materiality. If our debate goes no farther than the language of neoclassical economics, we're done for because you can't make an economic argument for human survival. You have to make a spiritual argument for human survival. We're worth it and we're worthy in that higher sense. Uh, 